Okay, lovely. Um, so, hi everyone. Thanks, thanks for being here, and thanks, of course, to uh, to, to the organizers for inviting me. And so, so today, I, I sort of want to present kind of a, a certain picture of two-dimensional Hamilton, Lure theoretic picture of two-dimensional Hamiltonian systems that's kind of um, emerged a bit in the course of my doctoral work, and sort of some of its consequences. Um, and it, okay, so this is necessarily going to be a bit terse. And but if, if you're interested, um, you know, there's uh, the details are in a preprint I've posted to the archive. Um, and um, yeah, okay, let's let's get started. So I, I sort of want to take just to give a bit of a motivating question, you know, suppose that we have some generic Hamiltonian isotopy, um, what sort of qualitative dynamical information can be extracted from its, its floor complex, right? And so somehow, um, there's been a lot of work done on the, the homological part of this question, right? Um, you can read the original paper of Fleur in, in this way, um, a lot of work by Ginsberg Gorel, uh, Chalukin's done a lot of work on this kind of thing, Volterovich has stuff, and, and I want to highlight in particular sort of work by, done by Emilia Lehu and Seyfedini here, um, sort of computing spectral and the, the spectral invariant associated to the fundamental class for autonomous Hamiltonians um, on surfaces, uh, sort of in dynamical terms, just because somehow all of this work really emerges out of me trying to understand that paper uh, in sort of geometric terms. Um, and if you, you sort of think about what the obstruction to asking this chain level question is instead of the homological question, um, it, you know, if, if you reflect on it a while, you sort of realize that it's basically because we don't really understand solutions to Fleur's equation all that well, sort of the extrinsic geometry of them, right? Um, if I give you two orbits and I ask you, are they connected by a Fleur cylinder? Well, unless you can kind of rule them out, rule it out by kind of action index kind of considerations, it's it's pretty difficult to tell if there are cylinders and if so, sort of how many. So, you know, good luck computing the differential. Um, and this is sort of a bit of an unsatisfying state of affairs if you kind of compare things to, to Morse theory, for instance, right, where you have kind of a, a good picture of things. Um, but it turns out that in low dimensions, um, there's sort of enough structure that you can make make some headway and, and end up giving kind of a nice picture of these things. Um, and I'm not gonna be able to talk about proofs today, but I just wanna give some idea of the flavor of the ideas that go into this. And so uh, this work sort of employs kind of braid theoretic notions, fundamentally kind of considering periodic orbits as forming braids um, in, in sort of the, the mapping torus. And then positivity of intersections for sort of graphs of Fleur type cylinders plays a big role. And then this is combined with sort of um, a, a circle of ideas that kind of originate in the contact setting from uh, Hofer Wysoki Zender's work on uh, finite energy foliations with uh, sort of some later additions by, uh, by Richard Seifring on sort of the, the relative asymptotics of, of these sorts of things. Um, so, so the setting that I want to kind of consider is suppose we have a closed symplectic surface, okay, no boundaries. Um, in particular, if you want to deal with boundaries, probably Barney Bramham is the guy to go talk to about that. Um, but so I'm on a closed symplectic surface. I have a periodic Hamiltonian. And we sort of consider this Thurstonian picture of things where we sort of suspend things to the mapping torus. And we get you know, a flow on the mapping torus such that uh, the integral curves of, of this, the, the suspended vector field are essentially sort of graphs of the orbits of your isotopy, right? And the sort of the philosophy here is that we, we think of the graphs of the one periodic orbit, so those things that close up in time one as forming a braid in the mapping torus. And we want to understand sort of how the topology of this braid combined with information about sort of the Conley Zender index, which measures sort of local sympathetic rotation, um, controls or relates to the structure of the, the Fleur complex. Okay. And of course, if we want to work on the sphere for the Conley Zender index to be a, sort of a well defined integral grading, we need to work with cap braids. And, and somehow it's just methodologically nice to work with cap braids as well because they, they end up kind of keeping you honest, even if you're working sort of not on the sphere. Um, so, okay, so, so what does this talk by, by a braid? What I mean is just a finite collection of smooth loops, okay, such that the, the graphs in sort of S1 across your surface are all pairwise disjoint. Okay, so in particular, they, they close up in time one. So these aren't perfectly general braids. Uh, braid theorists would tend to call these something like closed geometric pure braids. Uh, for me, this is just what I mean by a braid, all right? Um, a cap braid is what happens when I take a braid and then I just, to each loop or each strand, would, you know, suggestively call them strands, you know, to, to each loop I assign a, a capping sort of up to homotopy in, in the usual way, okay? 
And so I'm going to say that a cap rate is unlinked if you can choose sort of representative cappings, uh, such that in D2 across the surface, you, the graphs of these caps are all, are, are all disjoint. Okay, you, you should sort of think of this, these cappings really as providing you sort of a deformation of the braid to the trivial braid. Okay, um, but I'm not going to really get into that here. So, um, sorry. Um, so, for instance, here um, I, I've drawn sort of two capped orbits on, on the sphere. Okay, so we have the North Pole with the trivial capping. We have X here with the capping alpha. This is unlinked because, of course, the graph of alpha never intersects um, the the graph of N in D two cross the surface uh, the the sphere, right? But if I consider sort of N and the X with uh, the braid formed by the North Pole, trivial cap North Pole, and X with the beta capping. Well, that's linked because any any cap any capping that sort of is homotopic to relative boundary to beta is going to have to pass through uh, the North Pole. Okay. Um, we'll say that a cap rate is positive if you can choose cappings. Okay. Now now they're not disjoint, but the graphs aren't disjoint, but they intersect, but they intersect transversely and and positively. Okay. And okay, negative if the intersections are negative. Uh, so I, I just to, before stating the sort of the first result I want to get to here, um, I want to explain what I mean by chain level PSS maps. And so, you know, in, in their original paper, uh, Punic and Solomon Schwarz sort of constructed a natural isomorphism between your, uh, your symplectic manifold and the Fleur homology, right? And, um, you know, in, in this paper, sort of they give what, one way they, they sort of produce this uh, this isomorphism is by considering sort of chain, the map induced on homology by by certain chain level PSS maps, um, which map from the quantum chain complex associated to some more smale pair FG here um, into your Fuller complex. Okay, and it depends on some generic data, which here for us it's going to be the the more smale pair and sort of um, an S dependent uh, sort of family of, of Fleur data. Okay. Um, and I'm not going to get into sort of how this thing is constructed, but you know, basically, you you count disks which are holomorphic near the center, and which on some cylindrical uh, end they they satisfy the S-dependent Fleur equations for for, the, for this pair. Okay, so for generic de data, um, this ends up giving nice moduli spaces, and and you can sort of count these in in good ways in order to get this chain map. And so what I mean here by chain level PSS maps are these sorts of maps. Okay. Um, and so to motivate sort of this this first uh, this first theorem, this first result is is sort of you know there's a kind of natural question that if you've spent some time thinking about floor homology, you sort of a particular Hamiltonians, you've probably come into this kind of a question where you know if I if I have some fundamental uh, some some quantum homology class, say like the fundamental class, um, can you find me a cycle a floor cycle uh, which represents that homology class? And you know, in, in more theory, it's pretty easy to do. For instance, for the fundamental class, okay, well, I just take the sum of all the all the maxima, right? Easy, easy peasy. But in in Fleur theory, it ends up sort of being quite difficult. And I I, I don't really know um, outside of pretty narrow cases of, of, of cases where we can really do that. Um, but one approach to this question sort of would be to look at um, those cycles which can be hit by chain level PSS maps. Right, because this is a nice morphism on homology, you, you're guaranteed to at least have have one cycle, which is in the image of any given chain level PSS map. Um, and it turns out that sort of with these these techniques, the sort of of ideas um, that I was talking about, um, we can actually uh, completely characterize all um, all sort of all Fleur chains which represent a fundamental class um, under a, a chain level PSS map. Okay, um, and, and, and it's entirely sort of in topological terms. So the, the characterization here is that if you, a given chain represents the fundamental class if and only if you look at the braid formed by its support. Um, and if that braid forms what's called a maximally positive cap braid relative index one, um, which, okay, I have the definition here, but the fundamental point is just that it's, um, it's, it's a purely topological notion. It sort of only depends on the qualitative dynamics of your, of your Hamiltonian isotopy. Um, then you represent the fundamental class and it's, uh, via a PSS chain map and, and, and it's an if and only if, okay? Um, uh, excuse me, so when you say some chain level PSS, could you mm -hmm. please clarify what does it mean? Um, there exists a choice of regular data, so a more smale pair and some S-dependent uh, uh, S-dependent Fleur uh, equation, such that the associated PSS map at the chain level um, 
maps the fundamental class to that cycle. Uh -huh. And G is what exactly? G is a, 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 a metric that's- uh, No, J, J. J here, uh, like boldface J? Yes. Or, uh, so so boldface J is sort of an S, uh, sort of ST dependent, uh, almost complex structure. I see, okay, thank you. Yeah, which, yeah, which interpolates to sort of, you know, some autonomous thing um, mm -hmm. at, at negative infinity. Um, yeah, thanks for the question. So once you sort of have this characterization in hand, um, it ends up being sort of natural to kind of look at this quantity that's sort of inspired by the usual O short spectral invariance, right? Um, except instead of minimaxing over the, uh, if, instead of sort of infamizing the levels over all uh, FLIR, uh, over all FLIR cycles, which represent a given fundamental, uh, a given homology class or a quantum homology class, you in, you infamize the action over all cycles which represent that homology class, but which lie in the image of some PSS map. Okay, and, and somehow this is really related. This is detect the if this is different from the O Schwartz special invariance, which I don't know that that's the case. But um, what the difference is sort of due to fundamentally the geometry. Of, of certain Hamiltonian vibrations over, over the disk. Okay, um, I'm not gonna get into that, but uh, so, somehow that's what this is trying to, trying to detect. Um, and so, okay, it turns out that this doesn't depend on the complex structure, um, and it actually is a spectral invariant that bounds the usual O short spectral invariance from above. And if you work with the O short spectral invariance, then there's sort of a familiar list of properties um, that they satisfy. And basically these PSS image spectral invariants satisfy Almost all of the same, almost all of the same list, except for perhaps the triangle inequality. Okay, what what I can show for um, these PSS image uh, spectral invariants is sort of this weak triangle inequality, which is really a triangle inequality for the fundamental class. Okay, um, and so there are instances. So, for instance, on the sphere, um, the full triangle inequality is true, and and this is interesting maybe for folks who work with these spectral invariants a lot just because um, you know, there's this conjecture or sort of a folkloric conjecture perhaps that um, if you satisfy this list of spec, uh, th this sort of list of formal properties, then actually you should be the, uh, the O Schwartz spectral invariance. So, you know, um, this, this gives maybe a potential counterexample to that, uh, to that maybe um, belief, uh, at least on the sphere. Um, but okay, the real moral here is that almost any argument that you have, because for the most part, we work with those short spectral invariants through these formal properties, almost any argument that you have for O short spectral invariants are gonna adapt really straightforwardly to give a, an analogous argument for the PSS image spectral invariants, particularly if you're using, concerned with the invariant associated to the fundamental class, okay? Um, and why that's particularly nice is, well, be, in light of our characterization of those um, cycles which represent the fundamental class and live in the image of some PSS, a chain level PSS map, well, you can sort of explicitly compute um, this spectral invariant associated to the fundamental class um, in, in terms of, basically in terms of the dynamics of your, uh, of your Hamiltonian isotopy. Um, okay, and you, you could actually also, there's a less nice characterization of those cycles which represent the point class um, that you can get from, from this picture of things. Um, but somehow even dimensional homology class, quantum homology classes are, are not, um, there, there are fundamental obstructions to kind of characterizing these through these methods, okay? Um, and so as, as a corollary, uh, as a corollary, for instance, um, you know, you can define uh, a norm with the, the, the spectral invariant in sort of the usual way, the analogous way as you would with this uh, PSS spectral invariance, um, and you get, a symplectically bi-invariant norm, which is C0 continuous because, well, um, essentially the PSS spectral invariant is C0 continuous on surfaces, uh, thanks due to sort of an argument by say Fedini, which it adapts in sort of this straightforward way because it only uses the formal properties of the PSS spectral invariant. Um, and when it's non-degenerate, we can actually, when, when your Hamiltonian is non-degenerate, you can actually compute it entirely um, dynamically. Okay, um, here MN minus one is the collection of maximally negative uh, cap braids relative index minus one, which sort of means exactly what you would imagine it to mean. Okay, so that's sort of one set of results. Um, and with the same kind of picture of things, um, we can sort of address another sort of interesting question, which, you know, if, if you think about Morse theory, it, it tells you, 
what's okay what's good about morse theory like why why is morse theory indomitable for instance right um well is because you fundamentally care about about functions and morse theory tells you sort of how to think about functions geometrically or topologically right um and so in symplectic geometry i you know there's a strong argument that we should fundamentally care about hamiltonians um, and it would be nice if Fleur theory could tell us how to think about Hamiltonian isotopies or Hamiltonian diffeomorphisms geometrically or topologically in, in sort of an analogous way. And of course, you run into the same problem in trying to do this, that we just don't understand the extrinsic geometry of Fleur cylinders well enough. Um, but OK, we can, it turns out we can remedy this to some degree. Uh, so I want to introduce a, 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 an important notion for, for doing this, which I call sort of Mermbrays or maximally unlinked uh, relative uh, cap grades which are maximally unlinked relative to the Morse range. Um, and so these are cap grades such that um, all of their strands, all of their cap strands have index lying in the range minus one to one. Um, they're, they're unlinked braids and moreover they're maximal with respect to these two conditions. So if you take any other any other capped orbit um, which is not an X but and which has index in the Morse range, then that's necessarily linked with um, with with X, okay? So if you if you add it to X, you get a, you get a braid which is not unlinked, okay. Um, and so note that um, this such braids are not necessarily maximally unlinked, right? There could be orbits capped orbits which are have index not in the Morse range which which aren't linked with X a priori, right? Uh, it turns out that that actually can't happen, but um, that's a non-trivial fact. So so here's you know a picture if. Um, if the south pole with the trivial capping has index minus one and this orbit z which rotates around the equator um, once with capping beta has index one then um, z beta with and the trivial cap south pole is a membrane okay um, and so if with these these objects sort of turn out to be pretty central to developing a geometric picture of things on surfaces because um, we can sort of prove this theorem which says you know if you have any membrane um, then you can construct, you know, a, an oriented singular foliation of the mapping torus, which, okay, is, is basically sort of, if you work in contact geometry, this is somehow an, an open book decomposition. If you're familiar with finite energy foliations, this is a projection to the mapping uh, torus um, of, of, a, of a finite energy, an R invariant finite energy foliation, right? And the important properties of this, uh, of this foliation are sort of that the singular leaves are exactly the orbits of your, of your membrane. And, the regular leaves um, are, are cylinders which are essentially parametrized by um, Fleur cylinders running between those orbits, okay? And it has a particularly nice dynamical property, which is that um, your vector field is positively transverse to every single regular leaf, okay? So this gives you sort of a nice picture of things, but a priori, we don't really know the structure of, of this foliation, okay? So you, here, here's a picture, for instance, you know, here's a single leaf, of this foliation, you know, if you in our previous picture, if, if this is the orbit Z, right, and then you imagine the the boundary is the south pole. This is a some Fleur cylinder running from the from Z to the south pole, um, and what I've got drawn down here are sort of cross sections which are obtained by intersecting your foliate this big foliation with the fiber at uh, at T, right, T cross your surface. You cut that, and you'll end up seeing sort of an S one family of foliations um, of your singular foliations of your surface. And the point is that these actually end up being um, Morse type foliations. So that tells you that the structure of your, of, of your MERM set is necessarily essentially this has the same structure as the critical points of a Morse function. Okay, and the way you sort of see that is um, given your, this foliation, at every point um, there's a, a, a single loop which passes through it given by sort of your, um, the foliation by Fleur cylinders. And you can associate to that point the action of the loop which passes through it, or the cap loop, for instance, it has a you know canonical capping if you're on the sphere, and that's a more spot function. Um, and if you restrict that function to the T fiber, what you end up seeing are um, Morse functions whose <clears throat> um, whose associated uh, negative gradient flow are precisely these uh, singular foliations, uh, sort of F X T. Okay, um, and and uh, so. And, and you also get a, a loop of diffeomorphisms given by sliding along things in the loop direction, okay, in the in the del t u direction, um, because again you sort of have a foliation by by loops of your of your mapping cylinder, 
given by given by your FLIR uh, your FLIR cylinders. Okay, um, and okay, if you sort of put all this together, it turns out that you get you can sort of move by your isotopy and then undo that by flowing back along the FLIR cylinder, the, the solar foliation given by the FLIR cylinder, and that defines an isotopy that's always positively transverse to um, this uh, sort of the 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 Morse type foliation of your of your surface um, given at, at the at the on the zero fiber given by the intersection of the big the big foliation with with the zero fiber, um, and okay, it turns out that what this ends up doing um, <clears throat> is this allows you to reduce the problem of understanding your chain complex in the Morse range to it's a, this is precisely equivalent to understanding the uh, the, the Morse functions um, of associated to sort of the, the time zero uh, intersection of this action functional um, together with understanding the combinatorics of the, the, the MERM set. So how sort of maximally unlinked relative Morse braids all fit together. Okay, and, and, and if you understand one, you understand the other. Okay, um, so uh, one qu consequence of this, for instance, is that every um, MERM braid is necessarily maximally unlinked. Okay, so a priori, it didn't have to be complete unlinked with every, uh, it doesn't have to be maximally unlinked because you could have you know, capped orbits, which don't have Conley Zender index in the Morse range, which are unlinked with it. But okay, this geometric picture forces uh, any MERM braid to be maximally unlinked. And so finally, I just want to kind of remark that um, this ends up basically recovering uh, a certain portion of Le Calvez's theory of, of, um, uh, of, of singular of transverse foliations on, on surfaces. Um, so basically, you know, Le Calvez has this very general theory which looks at sort of maximal isotopies, uh, which I don't want to explain what those are, but you know, certain very nice, very good isotopies to a given homeomorphism, um, you know, isotopy of homeomorphisms to a given um, isomorphism, at, uh, homeomorphism at time one. And to any given maximal isotopy, you know, he can associate um, a, a, a oriented singular foliation, uh, continuous singular foliation with, Sort of a nice positive transversality property, such that if you have any path of your isotopy, um, you can homotope it relative endpoints um, and not intersecting any of the singular points of your of your foliation uh, to something which is positively transverse to to the foliation that he's he's developed. Okay, um, and so it turns out that the foliations that I was just talking about, these sort of Morse type foliations obtained by intersecting the big foliation with the the foliation at at, at, at time zero. Um, these are these are uh, end up being particularly nice um, instances of these Le Calvez type foliations. Um, it turns out that they're always sort of the, the quote unquote, unquote torsion low, which are sort of a, a, an interesting class that sort of emerges from a different perspective in, in Le Calvez's theory. Um, and in some sense, any torsion low isotopy, um, if, if you have any torsion low isotopy, you can um, you know change it to one where you can get one of these um, FLIR type foliations that we've just constructed. So somehow um, this gives a FLIR theoretic construction of uh, of the, the sort of the torsion low part of Le Calvez's theory for sort of non-degenerate uh, Ham smooth Hamiltonians. And actually these, uh, these foliations sort of are somewhat nicer than you have the right to expect from Le Calvez's theory because they're not just um, positively transverse up to homotopy, Right, these singular foliations actually, you get an isotopy which is positively transverse, sort of on the nose to your foliation. So there's sort of a uniform positive transversality condition. You don't, there's no homotoping of paths necessary. Um, yeah. Okay. So thanks everyone for for your attention. Uh, appreciate it. Thank you very much, Dustin. Any questions? Um, very faintly. Did someone ask anything? Yeah. Do you hear oh. me? Yes, Shira. Yes. Hi. Yeah. Okay. Uh, hey. So um, I have several questions. So one is, can you go back to your theorem A? Yes. With the spectral invariance uh, of the that measures sort of the chains in the image. Yeah. Right. So you had some conditions. So you have this. Uh, proper choice of the floor data. Do you have like specific constraints on this floor data that you need? Um, 
No, because I, uh, uh, no, I mean, it's just regular, um, oh, oh, sorry, this, this H, for the HJ, just like, yes, uh, you know, Fleur regular, so, so non-degenerate in the sense of Fleur, yeah. Okay, and your uh, spectral invariant is going to depend on your, okay, so you have your PSS map, and then you have the spectral invariant, can you go to the next slide with mm -hmm. the properties? Oh, yeah. Um, there was the, yeah, okay, thank you. Okay. Do you know? Do you know what the if you have like an energy capacity inequality, like? Um. You know. You yes. You should for basically for like the the norm associated to uh, the fun that you build out of the fundamental class. Yeah. Um. Because you you don't you, basically if you don't use um like the strong triangle inequality, right? If you don't have to consider sort of product of things that you know aren't the fundamental class. Um. Or at least where both of them are not the fundamental class, then everything sort of remains true um, for the, the anything you could say for the O-Schwartz spectral invariants are sort of true for these um, modified spectral invariants. Can you prove? Uh, did you mention that your spectral invariants are different than the O-Schwartz spectral invariants? Great question. No. Um, so somehow. Uh, Somehow the question of whether they're the same or not, at least on surfaces, um, is is basically equivalent to whether um, the PSS image spectral invariants satisfy um, uh, uh, satisfy uh, the sort of uh, Poincaré duality property that um, Entov and Filterovich sort of uh, show that, uh, that prove for the O. Schwartz spectral invariants, and so. Um, it, it turns out that if the PSS image spectral invariants um, also have the also have this duality property, um, the, then they will agree with the the O Schwartz spectral invariants. But otherwise, um, yeah, I'm I'm not sure. They they could be different. But do they depend on the only on time one map of your Hamiltonian flow? Or, or... On on surfaces, they do. The norm, the norm will only depend on the on the time one map. Um, but for you know, okay, on eight, yeah, uh, no, sorry, they, they, sorry, sorry. no, no, but the dependence on time one map is an argument based on spectrality and continuity. So, um, if you mean normalize, mm -hmm. you mean normalize the Hamiltonian and dependence on time one map. Is uh, based on if you forget the sphere. On no, the but yes, map. yeah, yes, of course. But but uh, if you have sort of the you know this you know if you have non-trivial sidal actions, um, then the the spectral invariance won't depend on on the time one. Uh, and, and sort of a similar thing is true for these PSS uh, these these PSS image uh, spectral invariants. Um, so the the ambiguity. So that's it. Also, the ambiguity is basically the same as for the O. Schwartz spectral variants. It, it comes from the the, the ambiguity due to the cytal map or cytal representations. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sorry, can you repeat the definition of this PSS image spectral invariant? Yeah. So you you look at the infimal level um, such that you can represent this uh, quantum homology class in your in your Fleur complex. Um, by a chain which lies in the image of some oh, PSS okay. chain map. What is lambda h here? Is this the action? Or... Um, yeah, it's it's the level, sort of the yeah the level of the floor chain. Okay. Can you is, so now then you're taking the infimum over these maximally something some uh, th there was some definition on theorem a. Yes. You're taking uh, no uh, no 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 not can you go oh. back to the statement of theorem a? Yes. So you're taking that infimum over uh, uh, maximal positive cap rate relative index one. Yeah. Uh, yes. Exactly. Yeah. Now these uh, maximal positive cap relative rates index one. Uh, so according to your theorem, uh, they represent uh, floor cycles, floor homology classes. Yeah. Is it a priori even obvious that they are cycles? That the boundary of one of these things is zero. So it's a consequence of your theorem that so even that part is not obvious. Yeah, I mean that's it. Even knowing if I give you a given Fleur a, a Fleur chain and I ask you whether it's a cycle, that's difficult 
to figure out. In, in the no, but, so I'm wondering if these conditions you're imposing just somehow, mm -hmm. is it, it should be, in theory, it should be easier to see that there are cycles than seeing that they actually represent. Oh, well, there. The, the difficulty, so, so the difficulty is basically that um, the condition of being a cycle is hard to interpret dynamically. But being in the image of the PSS map is somehow easier. Yeah. Yeah. Somehow the S dependence makes things easier. 